show, I'm hosting Chris Arnold. So Chris is the co-founder of Cosa Investments, one of the largest wholesale companies in DFW. Cosa is operated and managed by a U.S. virtual team, which has allowed Chris to run his company while living in Tulum, Mexico. Now, how awesome is that? He has closed over 2,500 real estate deals using a marketing channel that is very effective, but frequently overlooked the radio. So in his 15 years of working in real estate, Chris has perfected a method of micro-targeting the exact audience he is looking for and then creating explosive radio spots that result in prospects approaching him to buy their homes. Welcome to the show, Chris. Ali, thanks for having me. Excited to be on with you today. Yeah, absolutely. So you are recording this from Tulum, Mexico, right? Yeah, I've been down here actually three years, just past that mark. Wow, that's amazing. I think this is, I mean, you're living the American dream, right? You have income, you're running a company and, you know, from an amazing place. I was there and we were just talking right before we started recording. I was there several months before COVID. It's a really, really special place. Amazing place. I'm, I'm envious. I mean, I'm in Santa Monica right now and I'm envious of you. So can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, your background in real estate and how you got started? Yeah. So my story kind of starts at an interesting point. I'm actually a seminary graduate. So people are always like, huh, shouldn't you be like a pastor or doing like mission work? I was never very conventional like that. But what I really did have a passion for was adding value to the lives of people. So to me, people matter most. And so as I was graduating, I was, I was looking for a vehicle because I had one of two choices. I could you know, go the vocational route of, you know, helping people, which a lot of times requires you to go raise money. Nothing wrong with that, but I really felt like I wanted to be the person that was able to write the check and go add value. And so as I looked around, I was like looking for vehicles. And at 25 with a seminary degree, I didn't know much about business. So the only two things I really understood that were out there was either real estate or like investing, you know, in the stock market. So that was an easy decision because math is not my strong suit. And so real estate it was. And that's honestly how I made that decision to, to get on the road for real estate as simply a vehicle. Got it. What year was it when you were involved in your first transaction and what was it? Yeah. So 2005, I just knew I needed to like somehow get, I mean, we're going all the way back. It's been like 15 years, right? I just need to get off the bench and into the game. And so at the time, the way that I got my start was just getting licensed as a real estate agent and going and working at Century 21 and helping people sell their houses. I mean, very fundamental, but it was enough. I think it's important just to get on the road. It got me going down that road, which I knew was going to lead me ultimately to where I wanted to go. And so my first deals, honestly, from an agency standpoint, before I started my investment company, was just getting that old 3% commission for selling a house. Got it. Got it. Interesting. So I want to talk a little bit about the asset class. And I know you've mentioned single family homes, but I actually want to talk this time about freedom as an asset. I know, you know, usually when you think of an asset, you think, okay, is it real estate? Is it a stock market? And within real estate, is it multifamily, single family, student housing? I definitely see freedom as an asset. And you, you have a lot of freedoms. I mean, that's how it seems from, you know, my point of view. You're running a real estate company from Tulum. Can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, owning your time and having freedom? And maybe you don't have as much as I think, but if you can talk about that, you know, freedom as an asset, I think that would be really interesting to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Because my view of business has always been just a delivery system for me to be able to focus on what I value most. Again, if I look at my core values, one of my personal core values is freedom. And if I really wanted to move to a place of having impact, I really felt like there were four freedoms to be specific that I needed. I needed freedom of time. I couldn't do what I wanted in the world if I was swiping a clock from nine to five. I needed freedom of resources, the ability to write the checks, to do the things that I thought were valuable. Freedom of thought, I think, is another important you know, element under this umbrella of freedom. And as it's difficult to help someone else when you're so focused on figuring out how to pay your mortgage and fix the broken down car. And again, that 
honestly is a lot of what we see in the US if you look at statistics on how much savings people have and how much debt they're in. And then lastly, which I, you know, attained about three years ago, which was freedom of location, which meant that I could go and do what I do anywhere in the world. And so, you know, people talk about freedom. I needed to break that down into bite-sized chunks for me. And so the second element of that too is always the team. I've got, again, we run on a completely virtual platform for the three real estate companies that we run. And because I understood that, you know, my job was to lead it, not do it. You know, leadership for me was not necessarily about making sure everything was done perfectly right, because if that's the case, I just do it myself. It was about getting things done through other people. So really the optimal level of freedom I get is from really empowering an incredible team that pretty much runs all the day-to-day. So I'm out of the day-to-day operations, which does give me that freedom to really focus on what I want to do. Yeah. And I think what, something that you said really resonated with me And I think it's an amazing concept. And, you know, every entrepreneur and company owner is, I think, everyone struggles to find the right balance between when is the quality of the work? It's never going to be 100% the way that I want it. My question basically is, how do you make sure that you are able to let go of control, especially if it's remote, because, you know, the people are not going to the office, they're not with you every day. How do you let go of control? And how are you okay with the work not being done 100% based on how you want it to be done? So giving up control, I think, is probably one of the biggest hindrances I see to people elevating out of the day to day. Yeah, I run a community for some of the top real estate investors in the country. All those guys fly down to Tulum, um, Multipliers Brotherhood. So I watch these guys, right? And I see them trying to get out and the control issue is tough. So again, a couple of philosophies. I remember I read John Maxwell, I think said it really well. If someone can do something as 80% as good as you, then you should delegate it. And you just have to come to the fact that your business is your baby. And the reality is no one is going to treat and take care of your baby to the level that you do. And you just have to realize it. And so you kind of have to make that decision as the old founder dilemma go, do you want to be rich or do you want to be king? And be king, yeah, you can call all the shots. But the problem is that's what we call centralized leadership. Everything is dependent upon me. You remove me out of the equation, the business stops, right? But if you want to be rich, you're going to have to decentralize your leadership And again, I think it was uh, Robert Kiyosaki said, I measured the success of your business by how long it would run if you stopped working in it today. And so for me, that's a big thing. I want to be the thing that can be removed out of the equation and not let my ego get in the way of that. And then the second question you asked is is management, right? I've really come to learn over 15 years and I devote a lot to just leadership. I love, love that topic. You know, if you're having to manage your people, you don't have the right people. You know, if you get talented people, those people, for the most part, are going to be self-motivated. They're going to be self-driven. They're going to be self-disciplined. And your job fundamentally is to just give them a vision and get out of their way because those type of people will make it happen. And so a lot of my management issues in the beginning were because I didn't have the right type of people. And so why I don't worry about it now is because I have people that are self-managed. I've got the right people in the right seats. Yeah, very, very hard to find the right people. And I think when you do have the right people and it took me time, you know, to realize that you have to let go of control because a good employee, you know, that will drive them crazy. If they're the right people, they need to have the autonomy. That's really interesting, especially since you're doing everything from such an exotic place like Tulum. So, you know, Chris, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the strategy part of your business. And, you know, you're basically, you're using the radio to find discounted properties. Now, before we get to that strategy, I want to take one step, you know, backwards and, and just basically ask, do you think that today in COVID times, do you see a lot of discounted deals? They dropped. And I'll tell you why. I don't think any of us anticipated this. We thought that COVID would actually increase because again, where does a deal come from? Circumstance creates the deal. So you would bet on the fact that COVID is upping the circumstances, right? That cause people to need to sell at a discount. 
But what we've seen is because of government bailout, because of a lot of the leniency, people have been able to kick that can down the road and not have to make that tough decision about selling. But my belief is that's starting to come to an end. And so just as always, you're going to have kind of a dam that's got pent up demand that needs to get taken care of. And so as you see the safety net begin to remove, I think it's possible that we're going to witness a flood of stuff coming in. But the, definitely the reason it's dropped is there's just too much of a safety net right now. So we experienced that, I mean, in the most basic of real estate investment, which is single family. Yeah. And I can say that I see the same thing with multifamily. You have, you know, most class A and B assets are doing just fine. And those who are struggling, they don't need to pay, you know, the debt right now. So they're basically, you know, there is some sort of a bailout. So they're not incentivized to sell at a loss or to give any discount. And you're definitely, I think, you know, to some extent, you're paying a premium, you know, for assets that are pretty much, you know, performing well during COVID. Now, let's go back to talking a little bit about the radio, because I think this is an interesting, you know, idea. How do you use the radio to find those discounted assets in today's market? So I call radio fundamentally the way I describe it is the marketing channel that everyone knows about, but no one's using you know, people step back and they go, radio, there's nothing new about that. But the application of radio to find discounted assets, that's what's new. Because if you're listening, I would ask you this question, who do you hear in your market that's utilizing radio to create those opportunities? And here's a couple of reasons why people don't step into it. It's, again, it's always assumptions that hold people back from moving in the right direction. So a big assumption is people confuse themselves as their demographic. So just because you download Spotify and stream music or listen to Pandora doesn't mean that your demographic does. And I don't care if we're talking multifamily, single family or whatever. One of the largest demographics that exists for us is over the age of 50. And those people still have two habits that they developed growing up. And that is they listen to the radio and they watch television. And when you hear that, the light bulb should go off and you should go, you know what, you're absolutely right. If I'm targeting those people, because usually it's the mom and pop that are older, whatever that scenario is, we see it again and again, that would require them to want to get out from underneath or sell or, you know, even probate different things like that. And then the second assumption I see is that it's not affordable you know, people constantly come in and go, man, I probably have to start with $10,000 a month on radio. We help people set this up all around the country. And our average student begins with $1,000 to $2,000 a month. That's nothing to get up and start advertising on a radio station. So now all of a sudden, I think it becomes a lot more in people's grasp when they begin to remove those assumptions. Very interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought of the radio, but when you lay it out this way, it makes total sense. A lot of 50 plus year old people, they own single family homes and they do listen to the radio. We're not, we're a different age group, but it doesn't mean that this is not, it's funny because it's the most conventional marketing tool that nobody's thinking to use because everyone is thinking today about, you know, the internet and fancy text messages to certain, you know, demographics and you know, Facebook ads and AI, but you're basically saying, go back to the basics. Who is your target audience? A hundred percent. And again, utilizing the same taxes that you're talking about, like social media marketing or digital marketing. Again, people over the age of 50, for the most part, are not getting in and utilizing a lot of Facebook. I guarantee you they don't have Instagram. But the two things you have to realize that are happening in the mind of someone that's listening to the radio over 50 and and even under that age, two things occur. It's no different than television. You get the benefit, first of all, of celebrity status. Where do celebrities come from? We know psychologically what happens in our mind when we see someone on television. This is why we have movie stars. You get that same effect for your name and for the brand that you have within the cities that you're advertising. And then the second thing is, and again, we know that trust over the age of 50 is really important, right? We know that that age group really values the old fashioned handshake. And what you find with radio is you get what's called instant credibility. So people make this assumption because you're on radio, you must know what you're talking about because only people that advertise on radio are experts. 
That is the assumption that most of the public makes when it comes to radio because they have this mindset that it's super expensive and you must have been doing real estate for years and years and you could be six months into real estate and advertise on radio and still get that same status that someone in your market for 15 years doing it is getting and you're getting it immediately. And I don't find with a lot of the other marketing channels that you're getting those two benefits, particularly if you're using a spam approach direct mail, right? Text blasting, ringless voicemail, all of those types of things, they turn people off. You're spamming people. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is a good segue to talk about the process of, you know, posting your ad on on the radio. It's not actually posting. See, I'm used to say posting because that's what I have in mind when I'm thinking about advertising. Yes. So airing your advertising on the radio, what would be the process? Let's say someone is looking for discounted single family homes and they come to you for help. How does the process look like? How much does it take? You know, you talked about how much time does it take and also how expensive is it? So as I mentioned on the expense side, we're talking about $1,000 to $2,000 a month to get started. So let me do the math on that. Every station we start and finish with 100 ads per month. So that's 25 ads per week, five ads per day, Monday through Friday. That is a lot of frequency. So if you're backing into that math and going, well, Chris is saying 1000 to 2000 that's absolutely right. We are buying radio for starting off at 10 to $20 for a 60 second spot. People can't fathom that we're buying it, that it's nothing. And that's what I'm saying. That's what keeps people away. But we buy radio no differently than we buy real estate at a deep discounted price. Now, if you tell the average American that we buy, I'll use single family as, as a example, at 60 to 70 cents on the dollar and we run large million dollar businesses doing that, they can't wrap their mind around that because they just pay retail. That's what you do. You call a local real estate agent and you go pay retail. And if you get 5% under, you go brag to your friends that that was a great deal. So the same is true with radio. Everyone just thinks that you pay retail for radio. So the first process that we do is we size up stations in someone's particular city that they want to advertise. We do due diligence and we pull out reports. We access those through a system called Nielsen. And those reports literally tell us everything we need to know about that station. How many people listen, how many people listen hour by hour, how many own versus rent, what percentage are over the age of 50, everything. When we go in and negotiate with the station, we're completely armed and they are not used to this because the typical person calls in and says, I want to advertise and they send you over a retail media packet. And if you're listening and never done radio, you're laughing because that's probably the way that you went about it. But our way of doing it is we go and we tell them what their station is worth based on actual data and they cannot refute that data. Now, they might not always accept that price or might need us to get in and negotiate and follow up until it's done. But what we find is almost always, and I sincerely say that, very rarely does it happen that they will not eventually break and accept that price. And that's why we're buying radio so cheap, which gives us such a good ROI And again, everyone wants to know, the biggest question anyone that's listening right now needs to be asking is, well, what is the ROI on radio? It's three to four dollars. So for every dollar we're spending, we're getting somewhere between a three to four dollar return back based on the deals that we're doing and the profit that's coming in. So that's tripling to quadrupling what you're getting on your marketing spend, which is really strong and it's consistent, which is even most important. That's fascinating. And I think the tactic that you've been using, it's actually, I'm, I used to be a lawyer in my past life. So that's uh, one of the best tactics when you don't just go and say, Hey, this is what, how much I'm willing to pay, but you're using external resources as a benchmark. It's harder to argue against it because it's not just, you know, you didn't just come up with this number. It's backed by data and it's much harder to push against data. It gives you a lot more credibility and, and it's also Speaking of negotiation tactics, there's a great book called Never Split the Difference. I don't know if you read that by, I think, Chris uh, Voss. Yeah. That's his full name, if I remember correctly. And that's one of the tactics there. And I remember, you know, in business school, they also taught us this tactic that I've used in the past 
So sometimes it can backfire if they call you out on it and, and you're bluffing that that's your, you know, your maximum price. So it happened to me too. But generally speaking, that's a really good, you know, negotiation tactic. That was really interesting. Do you, one last question before I move to the lightning round questions. Do you work only with clients that want to purchase single family homes or if they want to reach, you know, a broader audience based on their needs, you can pivot and make a suggestion? I think that radio can be used for different assets. Obviously, single family is valuable because there's so many single family homes. Let's compare that to multifamily, right? But I definitely think it can be used for a few different assets that you're going to go after. I mean, even if you're listening, I mean, one of the things as well would be creative financing, right? If you're buying on terms, I mean, there's so much to do there when it comes to subject to and seller finance. And so we're talking about more sophisticated type of financing and doing deals than just, let's say, a traditional fix and flip. So definitely, absolutely, it can be used across the board. But for sure, we work with a lot of people on the single family front because there's so much investment opportunity on the rental portfolio side if you're trying to build that passive income. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, Chris, we have arrived to the lightning round questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Fire away. What do you got? All right. So, Chris, what's your favorite hobby? Right now, it's been paddle surfing. So you take paddle boarding and you mix that with trying to ride waves. Again, we don't have big waves in Tulum, so you can't surf. And so I have been really trying to get better at paddle surfing. Paddle surfing. So you still do it with a paddle board. Yeah, but you're surfing. But you can actually stroke and like, you know, keep up with the wave if it's small so you can ride it longer. Very nice. What's the one thing that people don't know about you? Usually it's I'm a seminary graduate. Most people never guess that because I'm doing business. So what do you wish you had known when you just started in real estate? Yeah, I can tell you I get asked that question a lot. You know, I waited three years before I hired my first coach or business consultant. And I honestly think I wasted a lot of time. I've just learned over the years, if I want to accomplish something, I don't care if it's physically in the sense of working out, if I want to better my marriage, whatever it is that I'm trying to attain, I will always get there faster and more efficiently by hiring a coach. And so I, I spend quite a bit of money on, you know, putting the right type of people around me and getting that paid counsel. I think it's priceless. I really do. I invest quite a bit of money in that. And I wish I would have known that the first three years in business. I wasted a lot of time on trialing in there and stuff I didn't need to. That's nice. That's a good answer. I haven't heard that one before. What's your number one advice for investors who want to scale their portfolio? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is utilizing uh, like a fractional chief financial officer to build out your models that you have. You know, I ended up hiring one a few years back and I just realized when you're building assets and you're growing something, there's just a level of sophistication that comes with an actual financial model. Being able to, you know, look at a rolling 12 months to be able to forecast and so forth. And I see a lot of people that I see doing portfolios, you know, they're doing a lot of that math themselves and maybe they're decent at it, but you'll never be a CFO that knows how to interpret data and to use that data as a weapon. And that was something that I didn't understand until really I hired my first CFO. And so I think getting financial models from a CFO is crucial. And that's different than a CPA and bookkeeper looking past tense. I'm talking about a true CFO looking future forward. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Chris, thank you so much for your time. I think we've uh, reached the end of our fun episode today. If people want to reach out to you and talk about single family homes, posting on the radio or any of the other things that we've discussed today, where can they find you? Yeah, a couple. Um, again, if you're a person that just loves education and tapping in and just want to kind of keep up with the overall story of what we're doing. Again, we talked about one business, but we have a couple other businesses we run. You can definitely go to YouTube and subscribe at Chris Arnold Real Estate. And if radio is something that you are interested in, I would tell you, it begins with due diligence. You might have been listening going, oh my gosh. Again, that's usually what I get when we help people. Like I heard you talk about radio and it was like, I totally get it. It totally makes sense. So the best place to go to is wholesalinginc.com forward slash REI radio, wholesalinginc.com forward slash REI radio. Book a call, ask questions, do your due diligence, and even see if your market's open as well.